It's just after 1 a.m. when Detective Frank Calhoun gets an urgent text from his captain, along with a call from his partner, Detective Fred Lyons. An off-duty rookie police officer and a young woman have been murdered. The rookie is the brother of a powerful person in the streets of Chicago. What was his relationship with the woman who was murdered? And why were they killed? And who is the real target of the murder? Anytime a police officer is murdered, there is a high level of pressure to solve the crime. But in this case, Frank Calhoun and his partner must work their way through a complex web of dangerous relationships to solve the murder. Welcome to I Found This Great Book. My name is Curtis, and that is how the new police procedural, Blue Religion, opens up, and I have the honor of introducing you to the author, Alvern Ball. Alvern, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Uh, it's an honor, and I'm um, really, really excited about what you're doing here. And so we're going to dig in. Uh, love a good police procedural. Love a good hard-biting uh, work that, that keeps you turning the pages, and that's what you do. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> so your sleuth, Frank Calhoun, uh, has some heavy demons he's fighting with. Can you give us some insight into these and why you made these choices when creating this character? I actually, I guess it happened by happenstance um, in some ways um, because of the first novel, um, Only the Holy Remain. And this is giving nothing away. But um, Frank is dealing with the fact that he had to arrest his father um, for murder of his former, um, of his previous partner. Um, his father is a, also a cop. And so he's dealing with these demons of um, the fact that his father had a son that he didn't know about um, that turns out to be his like his best friend. And then his father is then incarcerated for the murder of this best friend slash partner. Um, and so that was something that just kind of happened. But was I had no idea that was ever going to happen. Um, that story literally kind of wrote itself. And then. Um, when it came to the blue religion, I didn't actually um, know I was writing a police procedure. <laughs> I just <laughs> knew that um, I was gonna. I had the story to tell, and um, and I knew I wanted to touch on um, police officers and this 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 like rank and file, this religion, you know, of of the blue religion of like you know this the code of silence and stuff like that. And um, so I didn't know I was gonna actually write a police procedure. I just knew that. Um, I wanted to write a story about this cop. And as I started to write the story, what I didn't know was that there were other demons, like I said, about the father's past, about what he as a character was going through, trying to still deal with the fact that he had arrest that, you know, he made the arrest. He put his father in prison, you know, and, and still with the fact of like coming back onto the job and then being looked at as like, you're the son of a cop killer, but you're still a cop. Like, how does that work? You know, <laughs> and everybody in that department knows who you are, knows who your father is, knows like how big this case is. And so, you know, you're never really trusted to be a cop. Um, so it was just something I was looking at when I started writing it. It was just the, I guess, the human effect of um, writing such a novel. I, I was just going with what I felt, I guess. And um, Frank just came alive on the page or in the pages and kind of took me along for the ride in some ways mm, mm. yeah because you know you, you a lot of times and in, in, you read some police procedurals and things that just really kind of you know i'm a cop that's all i do it's like i'm a machine but you have these human beings and they're complex but they're wrapped in the group called the police and uh it, it's really fascinating you you bring a human a human feeling to the officers, all the officers in this story. And that's really great. So uh, wow, Frank you. and his partner are both black male detectives in Chicago, but they're not super close friends. I don't get, you know, in fact, no. well, early yeah. on in the story, 
uh, early on in the story, his partner, uh, Fred Lyons, is, was offended that the captain thought he would be able to relate to Frank just because they were both black. You know, how do you uh, use that relationship all through the story? Um, yeah, so it's funny. Um, again, I, it, in some ways, it's, 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 I guess it's fate um, that Fred Lyons became his partner because in the first novel, Fred Lyons appears for like a line mm. in the first novel. And he is one of the cops that um that kind of um treats Frank at least with some type of respect, you know. And so um I when I was writing um Blue Religion and I was trying to figure out how Frank because he's coming back onto the force, you know, after being gone for like a year um on on leave. Um it was something that always struck me was that um, whenever I was working with another black person or, you know, or it'd be two of us, it was always just like, oh, you guys should relate because it's like, why should we relate? I remember I was working with this young woman um, and our boss goes, um, she was, again, she was tall, but she was a black African-American woman, of course. And, she, and our boss goes, oh, you took like, at one point she goes, you two look like you could be related. And we looked at each other. And we looked at her and she caught it as soon as she said it. She was like, oh, my God, I didn't mean it that way. And But it was just like, yeah, you did mean it that way. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like because because we're two black people, we're supposed to just relate and know each other. And, and it's this idea um, of um, what I call the, like, the uniformity of, you know, um, like we can only have one black representative. We can only have one black this and everything has to be a monolith. Um so when the idea of Fred Lyons came into play, um, I was looking at, I was thinking about how does Frank come back onto the scene and come back into the department after being gone a year and then, you know, dealing with this incarceration and then, uh, and then in the first book, dealing with the, with solving this murder that he's not supposed to be working, you know, how does he come back? And I thought, well, okay, the only person um, that's in this, that's in this religion that that would be close to him would be the one guy that at least showed him some type of respect. Um, and that was Fred Lyons. And um, when they came together, I started realizing, oh, wow, they're the only two black cops in this, you know, in this division. So it gives them something to relate to, but it also makes them different because they may be two black cops, but they see the, the, the world in two different ways, you know, Mm -hmm. they see the religion of what they do in two different ways. And you see that on the page when, um, uh, when, um, Fred and, and, and Frank butt heads on this case and how it should be solved. And Fred is just like, I want to get it out. (laughs) I don't care how we solve it. Let's just solve it. You know? And you see Frank always kind of like, yeah, but did we do it by the book? Do we really go back and do we check off everything? And Fred's like, look, it's all checked. And, you know, <laughs> and that kind of thing. And then um, as it came, you know, um, the mystery of this thing, um, when I think about those two, um, I didn't even know. It was like, I always think about, um, when I think about mysteries, it's always the, the little red herring, you know, that are out throughout the book. And for me, it's always, I always think about small things uh-huh. um, when it comes to a, when it comes to a case, the stuff that you never think is important or the thing that you thought was important isn't as important as you thought it was. And it's always the small things that we overlook, I think, in everything. And um, that's what it was for me. It was always the, like Fred had a bigger picture and Frank was always looking, trying to see the small things. And those two um, beliefs or aspects of how they come at the case, you know, they, from the instant, the moment they arrive on the scene, they have two different ways of um, investigating the case, you know? And I think, and I think that helps. Yeah, you set that tone early on that, okay, we're different, which, you know, it is, it is funny because, yeah, that happens when, when, especially when people aren't used to, and they see other people as other, uh, and they just assume, oh, you two should just get along. Like, why? You know, (laughs) you know, that that would be like, you know, let's say there was a, 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 the, the guy who did the mass shooting in Vegas. Okay. So he was a white male. Mm-hmm. If I just right. randomly went up to white males and said, so why did he do that? And they would look, Oh, how am I supposed to know? What? Well, right. I mean, you're both white. Right. You're both male. Right, right, you're both right. in your forties. Right, right. Why wouldn't you know? And they would look at me like I'm crazy, but here it's like, well, you're both black and yeah, 
you you should know each other. And that's not, no, you just because you only know two black people doesn't mean (laughs) that I I know a whole lot of them. uh, Right. Yeah. And, and, and that's just a part of being in a society, you know, it's that unconscious thing. It's not a conscious, I'm going to keep you down thing. It's just the unconsciousness of being in the majority and not having to mm-hmm. think about it. So I, I like, yeah. I like the way you play that and it's very realistic. You know, it's not over, oh, well, it's not you. beating you on the head. It's not like, you know, message is not like that. <laughs> it's, it's just, yeah, yeah. this is life. And these are some of the frustrations, but these two men also choose to be police officers and that's uh part and parcel, but then everybody else has their issues too. So it's not just, uh, Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. It's, uh, and that's, again, going back to one of the great things where I think people will get a lot from the story and see it as really realistic, valuable, is that, you know, people, police officers don't have just super clean lives. And uh, they're human beings, too. And they have relationships that mm-hmm. go south and the relationships between them. But they're all united as police officers, especially when there's a threat from the outside. And you captured yeah, that really it, well. Oh well, thank you. Yeah, and that was something I was I was really trying to um, think about, and and in some ways I think up subconsciously or unconsciously I, I was driving it because um, I was trying to have this balance of like how do you be a police officer but you know still live your life, and that was something I've always I talk about a lot was this this duality of this love hate relationship I have with cops. And the idea of writing crime fiction as a black writer, and you're writing about cops, but at the same time, you know, I can walk out my door and be harassed by a cop, or I have been harassed multiple times in my life, you know. And then I have friends that go, How can you write about that? You know, you know, we know the other side of that. We grew up, you know, being harassed by cops. So why do you want to write about cops? And I'm like, Because there's something that it's that the serve and protect thing that I always think about that model of um serve and protect and what that means um when you're a cop and that and that idea of this fraternal order of the blue religion is that you know you're out to serve and protect the society but then at some point if you allow the job and and the politics of it to take over your life you become that thing that you you become the enemy of the state you know mm-hmm. in a way you become you become um, the thing that you swore to serve and protect against, you know, and it, and it always happens. I always think about it every time there's a shooting of a black person or a murder of a black person by a cop. I always think about that one that one sentence that always comes out. Um, but there are good cops or, you know, um, they're not all cops are the same. You know, there are some good cops. And I go, well. If there are good cops, where are they? Why aren't we shining the light on that? Or why aren't those good cops stepping up in, in this bad time and going, hey, yeah, that was wrong. I'm going to step on the other side of that line, you know, and stand with the people that are saying that this is wrong. But instead, those good cops will stand in that same line with their with the bad cops or whatever, you know, and they all put up that wall of this is the blue religion. We don't, we don't, we don't cross that line no matter what. And that's when an, me as a writer and as a person, I'm just like, but why? Why won't you cross that line and take a stand and just be, even if you're the minority, even if you're the one, that one that shows like, hey, yeah, the phrase, there are some good cops. This is, this is the perfect example of that, you know, because if one did it, it would make so many more do it. And then yeah, you could weed out the bad apples, as you know, as they say. But, um, but that idea that um, I like to think that you know there are a lot of great cops, and that there are some bad cops. I like to think there are more good cops than bad cops, you know. But the idea that they have to go home, they have to take whatever they see, and especially when they see, you know, really bad shit, like you know, murders and stuff, they have to take that home and they have to swallow it and eat it and. And and live with it sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. and sometimes you can't share that with the world that you go home with because the people that you go home with don't really understand it, can't yeah. really see it the way you see it, you know. 
um, I grew up in a very, very rough neighborhood um, in Chicago. So in some ways, when I write about cops, I've seen it. I've seen the other side of that. And I understand, like, in some ways what they can go home with because it's a, it's a toll on the soul, you know. But it's at the same time when you, like I said, it's a religion. And when you won't speak out against that religion when it's wrong, then it's like, well, are you really, you know, then it's hard for me to say you're a good cop or a bad cop. You're just, you're, you know, you, you're in that gray area. Um, yeah. So I can go on and on about these things. Yeah. But <laughs> you, you also point that challenge all through because, you know, well, you know, police officers never see people on their best day. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> when, when they're called somewhere, People are probably having one of the worst days of their life. That's why the police officer shows up. They're not showing up because, yeah. hey, I'm having a great day. Somebody call the police right. and have them show up, you know. So there's yeah. something horrible going on. Um, and like you said, they have to see a lot of bad things and see things that can make you have a view of people that even mm -hmm. though these aren't all the, you know, you pass by a hundred people who were just minding their business, but you had to deal with this one thing. and. We always remember the 100. We always remember the one bad thing and not the yeah. 99 good things. Not that the went 99. By. We, we, exactly. just, we just ignore that because it didn't disturb our world. So, yeah, you right. point that in all of your characters. Again, at the beginning, yeah, you, you set the tone so clearly when they're at the murder scene and they're the way you describe it. And it's horrendous. And at one point, one of the detectives is like looking around the blown out skull of one of the victims and they're doing their job. But for anybody mm -hmm. else, it would be, Oh my God, how could you just impassionately look at this and pick at it? But yeah, he needed to do that to figure out what the heck happened. That takes a certain kind of muscle to build up that uh, yeah. most people don't have. Most people have nightmares for the rest of their life behind that. But mm -hmm. these gentlemen see this and they still keep going on. But it, you bring out those complexities that uh, people have. And that plays an important part in the story. So, uh, and we talk about the loyalty um, the police officers have to each other. Like you said, not being able to step over that line. and. And I got to understand that because once you're in a group, the last thing you want to do is a person who steps out because now you're outside that group and you still aren't a part right. of the other group, you know? So <laughs> exactly. You're ostracized for yeah. doing the thing that you swore to do, yeah. you know? And, and, and then now your safety is in danger from both sides, you know? Um, exactly. So, you, you know, you have to really be a strong person to step out, but. Can you give us some insight um, into the research you did to portray life inside the police force? Oh, so that was very interesting because at the time I didn't know any police officers that um, I could like turn to and ask questions about, you know, and I did, how's this go? So um, what I really ended up doing was I did um, a massive Wikipedia dump at one point mm -hmm. where I went through all of the different um stages or levels or whatever you want commands um within the chicago police department and then um, um i would drive to the city and i would walk around um certain buildings like go take a picture of it and then i um mostly i would imagine what that was like mm -hmm. um to because again i didn't have any police officer friends that i could talk to i didn't have any attorney friends that I could talk to. So a lot of it was pulled from like um in some ways imagination, but also from reading um others writers' works of how they handled cop situations in their city and also just trying to piece it together from what I've seen of fictionalized TV, you know, and, and kind of pulling the thread and going, okay, well, I know this is how cops have treated me and I've anytime I've had an interaction in my own neighborhood, you know, mm -hmm. how that's, how that's occurred or, um, being picked up in a sweep, um, in Chicago, they used to do it right around the time that there would be an election. They would call it a sweep. And the mm -hmm. sweep was that they would come through with a paddy wagon 
and they would pick up any and everybody that was on the street. No matter mm. if you were doing a crime or not, they would pick you up, they would sweep you, put you in a cell, and they would put you like in a holding cell for like 24, 48 hours, just holding you there with a whole bunch of other people, keep you off the street. And in a way, when you think about it, it's, it's voter suppression. Now that I think about it, wow. Because if it was a uh, day before an election, you were locked up, how were you supposed to vote, you know? Hmm. You know? So um, it was wow. called a sweep. And so I think about that. So I just think, uh, so when I was building out and trying to do the research, I was thinking about all the interactions I had had with cops, which were, like you said, always in a, a bad, it was always a bad situation. And most of the time, it wasn't a situation of my doing, you know? It was them interacting with me where I was just like, look, I'm just walking, you know? But because, you know, um, I'm dressed a certain way or I remember being pulled over, um, had I was in high school and I had left my part time job um, at night. And I was literally not even half a block, maybe 200 feet away from the place that I worked. And I realized as I'm waiting on the bus to go home that I didn't have my wallet on me. So I had to run back to the building before, you know, the manager locks up to get my wallet. And as I'm running across the street, all of a sudden, these two cop cars take off after me. And I'm thinking, like, they're chasing somebody, you know, because I'm running towards this, this store. And next thing I know, they're pulling up into the into the parking lot, hopping out. And they're like, and my boss looked at them like, what the hell is going on? And they're like, we're chasing this young man. He, he's like, why are y'all chasing him? We just literally walked out of the store, came back two minutes later, you know. And <laughs> my boss was like, are y'all really chasing him? Because we, we saw him running. And that was the whole reason. That they started like pursuing me or you know following me because they saw me running. And you were just trying to run back to work to get your wallet. Back to work to get my wallet before the you know for my manager locked up and left. And it was just like so I was two hundred feet away from where I worked, and you saw me running from a bus stop, basically across the street to the store, and y'all took off after me, like unmarked detective cars and they hopped out guns blazing like and my boss was like are y'all serious <laughs> you work here and they were like oh well we're sure we saw him running but that was the whole reason for why they chased or pursued behind me because they saw me i was black and running you know so stuff like that we uh, like i said i didn't have any major resources of um how the department worked but i did a crazy wikipedia dump um, just going through all the levels of um, the different hierarchy of the police department mm -hmm. and, then, and then imagining and then looking at all the ranks. That was one thing I did do. I took hours upon hours just reading the ranks of the different detectives and like and because Chicago is broken up in so many different divisions of detectives that I had to make sure that homicide, that if you're a homicide detective, you're in a certain division and that you fall under a certain um, command order. And so that part took some time to understand. Mm -hmm. But once I got it, I was like, okay, everything is, you know, it's, 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 a, um, it's a process and it's a chain of command. And so I imagine that in, um, in Chicago, especially when I was growing up, like if a white shirt, which was a sergeant um, in Chicago, if a white shirt showed up at a, um, at a, um, at a crime scene or any type of scene, that's the person that all people like would direct their problems to. Because no matter if you were mad at an officer or not, the white shirt was the one that was in charge. The white shirt was who you went to to basically like, I'm, I want to file, you know, this police report or I want to file this this report against this officer. Because the white shirt was the sergeant. The white shirt is the one that had to take, you know, had to really listen to you. Whereas well, the other officers, no matter if you ask them for their badge number. You know, they'd be like, fuck you, or I'm not giving it to you, or hide it or something. But the white shirt can hide it. You know, he had to be the one that was visible. His badge had to be visible. So it was stuff like that that I knew from growing up. And so um, it was just one of those things where it was like trying to put two and two together or putting the pieces of the puzzle. And once I started um, understanding the, how the pieces fit, I was like, okay, I got a good understanding of how this, this hierarchy works um, in Chicago Police Department. Okay. Cool. So, and, and then you have experience, you have your experience with them, but you still manage to not just make them all just, you know, raving lunatic demons just running around. You, you show the human right, side right. 
and uh, the challenge of what happened. You know, you had a murder of two people, and trying to solve that murder, uh, in spite yeah, of all like, the things that are put in the way, it's something. Yeah, because I like to think at the end of the day, no matter if you're a good cop, if you're what, how matter how society sees you, you know, think, and it's some to some degree depending on where you live and your economic, you know. Um, upturn or downfall you see cops in a certain way whereas if you're wealthy or if you're part of the majority and you're off you see cops in a different way so mm-hmm. i like to think um when i'm writing about them is that i try to see them as being human is that maybe on the day that i'm seeing you it's your bad day too so yeah. we're both having a bad day you know and sometimes um we figured out how to talk it out instead of yelling at each other or one of us tries to de-escalate this situation you'll probably see that the person that you come to serve and protect, they're going through something and then you you can relate to it. You know, mm-hmm. um, one of the biggest issues I have um, with um, all police is that there's really no community policing anymore. You know, there's nobody walking the beat. You know, um, I like the idea of like, like, OK, for instance, in black neighborhoods. Right. I feel like African-Americans, brown, you know, we should elect our police officers hmm. for our neighborhood. Meaning that if you're going to patrol this neighborhood, one, you either have to live in it. If we're not going to live in it, then we have to elect you to, to serve in it. We pay our taxes, right? So that means we pay your paycheck as a police officer, which means we should be able to then pick and choose who patrols these neighborhoods. And usually if there are cops that look like us, we're not going to have these same problems, you know, that we're having when, and I hate to say it this way, when white cops who don't live in these neighborhoods, who don't understand the economic downturn of how things have, you know, the, the disenfranchisement, the, the disinterest, the dis, um, investment in these neighborhoods, this is where that's created them. Whereas if you at least have a, again, a, a officer of color or an officer that um, hopefully that has lived um, somewhat to a degree of that same life, they're going to have a better understanding of how to de-escalate that situation. Now, that's also not saying that, again, it's not a monolith. All Black people aren't the same. So if you want to be, let's say, an Asian officer or, or a Hispanic officer or a Black officer or a white officer and you want to patrol this neighborhood, then you have to maybe write an essay as to why you want to be in this neighborhood, you know, to understand it, you know. Mm-hmm. And if that's not the case, if we can't elect or or pick and choose who we're going to patrol, then I'd rather us, if we can't do that, then I'd rather them have cops that actually walk the beat, that walk the neighborhoods. You know, I'm not saying you have to walk it when it's cold, but you should be walking it when it's warmer and getting to know your residents. So then you know who your real residents are, you know, your tax paying residents, and then you know who your criminals are, you know? And if there's no crime, then there's no cops. So there's always going to be this 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 um, dichotomy of good guys and bad guys somehow getting along, you know, um, for the greater good of society. But you know, and at some point you're going to arrest some, and some you're going to let go because they're minor crimes. You know what I mean? Like you're going to go, okay, I'm going to let you go. Like oh, before marijuana was now legal, you know, you might be like, okay, I caught you a little marijuana. I'm going to let you go off this, but remember. It's a it's a quid pro quo now, you know, quid pro quo now. I let you go off this, so maybe later on you're gonna scratch my back and give me some information or something, you know, mm-hmm. that may lead to something bigger. Or you're gonna tell me, hey, you know what? This crime is gonna go down. You might want to save these people. You know, when I was growing up, when something like with gangs would happen, the game bangers would tell us, yo, y'all need to go take a walk, or y'all need to clear the street, get off the street. And that was them telling us something's about to go down. I can't say what, but it's best you not be in this area when it goes down. Or it's best that, you know, you not be around when this thing is about to occur. And nine out of ten times, we'd walk away. We'd go where we're going, back in the house. And before you know it, stuff would pop off and you'd be like, thank God somebody told me, you know. And I think that's where if cops did a little more real community policing instead of like, Oh, we're going to do this. Um, you know, we're going to have this meeting where everybody can show up and voice their opinions. Just walk the neighborhoods, talk to the people that live there. You know, 
even if they don't like you and even if they look at you and give you these mean mugs, you can start to create your own database of who is who, you know. Um, one of the biggest things I think that, that always haunts me or I always think about it was one time I was coming home from college. And I was coming to see my grandma and I'm walking with a backpack. These two police officers roll up, grab me, throw me on the hood, pull my backpack out, dump everything out of my backpack, all of my college books, all my pens and papers on the ground. And they're like, we're looking for drugs. Where are your drugs? I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm literally coming from school. You know, I showed mm-hmm. them my college ID, all this stuff. We know you got drugs. They open up the books thinking like, you know, they're hollow. I'm like, I'm coming from school. Now, 20 feet away across the street are all the drug dealers, like mm-hmm. standing literally on a on a fence, like, you know, just lounging on a fence. And I'm like, so y'all think I'm the drug dealer, but mm-hmm. I know across the street, I can name every drug dealer there is. I can name everything that they do. And that's when it becomes like, oh, so you have no idea who you actually looking for. Because if you just stay in this neighborhood one week, you know who the dealers, who the shakers are, you know, who who controls what. But the fact that you got me, I'm a college kid, just coming home to see my grandma, and you just dumped everything out on the ground, and then you tell me, pick it all up. Okay. So now what you've done is I would have probably been one of your, I probably could have been an ally to you. I probably could have, if you had just asked me, I would probably point it out and told you, you know, oh yeah, this person does this, you know, I'm I'm not a snitch or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I, I grew up with that code. But the idea of like a quick pro quo, you know, you need information. I got information. Now I'm not going to tell you directly who's who, but I can help push you in a direction that helps you do your job and maybe then you go talk to that individual and maybe I'll work out a deal that, you know, because again, there's going to be crime. And if there's no crime, there's no police. So something is always going to be there. But the fact that you did all this doesn't make me an ally. Now it makes me an enemy, hmm. you know? So now everybody that was across the street knows you're the police, knows I'm not going to talk to you now because of what you just did. And now you've just created one more person now that's against you. Instead of for you. Right. Because after an experience like that. that (laughs) No, no, no. But after an experience like that, that. That. Would change you Uh, the same way, like you said, the police see things and and have to swallow that. You had to see that and swallow it and still maintain. You you just can't go home to see your grandma. just rant and rave. You know, like that's not why you were going, you know. Yeah. So it's it's and again you bring that up in the book. Hey, what time period is your novel set in in Chicago? It's set in present. It's set, set in present. present day. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And what role does the city of Chicago play in the story? Why there? Uh Chicago is a character within itself, which is anybody from Chicago will tell you that. <laughs> it's a, it's totally a character. Uh, but I chose Chicago because again, that's why I, I've always, I grew up, I lived, but I also chose it, um, more so because, um, I wanted to represent a part of the city that is never represented in anything that I've ever read, read about Chicago. Mm-hmm. And that's the West side of Chicago. Okay. Um, I grew up on the West side of Chicago in a place called K-Town and where I'm from, um, it is, it is very, very dangerous. It can be, but it can also be very loving and caring, at least when I was growing up. You know, um, when I go back there now, it's even more dangerous, mm-hmm. um, you know, and um, in the news, you always hear about um, murders and shootings in the neighborhood called Inglewood, which mm-hmm. is on the south side of Chicago. Well, um, before Inglewood became notorious, where I'm from, I'm from the west side version of Inglewood. OK, uh, you know. And so for me, it was this idea that everything I've always read about Chicago, it's always the north or the south side. And I wanted to represent the west side, and but I also wanted to represent the good that's on the west side. There's so much great um, culture on the west side of the city that um, it just gets it either is never written about or never talked about or it's overshadowed by the crime. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, 
you know, yeah, there's crime. There's crime everywhere. But there's, like, I remember growing up and having these amazing block parties, and you know, um, with people that were working class people. You know, my grandma um, used to own her own beauty salon in her basement, you know. So it's about this this idea of, um, you know, uh, black folks being working class and, and being middle class, you know. Um, there was a moment in my neighborhood where that was we were a middle class neighborhood, you mm-hmm. know. And then, the, and then, like most neighborhoods, the crack ec- epidemic changed that. Yeah, you know, um, I remember walking through my neighborhood, and my one of my best friends, his mother, was telling me how she used to come get her hair done at my grandma's house, and I was like, "Wait, what?" She says, "Yeah, your grandma used to do my hair, used to do." And then she was telling us like about all these different buildings that used to be in our neighborhood. She's like, "Yeah, that pool hall there, there used to be this, you know, this other, this other business used to be this store, and I, and it." Got me thinking of like, wow, what the neighborhood used to be, you know, mm-hmm. before the drugs and, and and that thing came in, because that was an apparatus of making money, of making, you know, more money than most people could imagine. So I, I imagine what those neighborhoods, what the, my neighborhood and, and many neighborhoods in the West Side of Chicago were like before drugs influenced and changed. And there was also this idea of... um disinterest or um non-investment in these neighborhoods and so for me um i just wanted to tell another side of chicago that most people don't get to see um i remember i was working at this um ice cream shop and i was talking to this lady and i was telling her where i was from and she was like wow you you you, you grew up over there because she uh, she was like an attorney and she was like and 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 she was just amazed by it and, and i had to ask her i said why is it amazing that I came from there when there's a thousand of me that I know that just as creative, mm-hmm. you know, but I'm that one out of a thousand that made it out in yeah. some ways. And for me, that always stuck with me as being like, it's amazing that I made it out, but there's a thousand more of me that you don't even know about that, that are 10 times greater than me. You know, it just somehow I got a chance that somebody else didn't get, yeah. you know? So, yeah, that's how Chicago became a character. Okay. So I can I ran a lot. <laughs> no, that's all right. That's okay. Now, and we've talked about this, but I just want to dig a little deeper. Now, the relationship between black people and law enforcement has been difficult to say the least through U.S. history. And how do your novels, uh, only the Holy Remain and also the Blue and also Blue Religion, explore that landmine filled path? Yeah, um, I I think for me, um, when you think about the history of law enforcement, it, some people would say, you know, and to some degree they're, they're true. It's a um, it's an extension of um, of um, what do they call the, the the slave chasers. You know, in some ways, I think about law enforcement um, was put in in place across all neighborhoods um, to keep the wealthy protected. You know to keep those more influential protected from those who have, you know, less. And then to some degree that is true. You look at how laws are written, you know, and who they benefit the most. Um, but when I think about um, law enforcement in the books and in Chicago and how uh, they treat, how they treat people, uh, I try to imagine that, um, that, you know, Everybody's on, I wouldn't say on a, uh, a, plain, uh, a level playing field, but I like to think that it's like a 60-40 or maybe 7-30, where, you know, um, 70 is, the, of course, the affluent, and the 30% is those, you know, who are less um, affluent. Um, and I like to try to, again, look at the human side of anybody that becomes a cop. I, I try to think of the idea that, they're not working for the KKK, that they did, that they didn't go in being a cop so they could oppress and kill everybody. Mm-hmm. I like to think that people have people that get drawn into it, are drawn into it because it's a way of life for them. Um, just like writing for me is the thing that I know I'm supposed to be doing. If I'm not doing it, it doesn't feel right, you know. And whether you're a gun enthusiast or, you know, you like breaking heads or you just like the toughness of like saying 
you came out of the, like the armed forces and you just love the idea of the adrenaline rush. That means it was meant for you. It was built for you, you know? And so I like to think that everybody goes into it with a noble cause of some degree, you know, whether you've seen a crime or whether you witnessed it, or maybe you just really want to change the world and make it better and protect people. You go into it with a noble um, idea and, and in going into it with that noble idea, I think it's up to the individual to make sure that their ideal doesn't become corrupted or doesn't change and shift and they become the thing, you know, again, they become an enemy of the state. They become the oppressor instead of fighting to actually, you know, serve and protect. That line always, I think, encompasses everything about a cop um, for me and the idea of how cops treat people and how they want to be treated. You know, you're there to serve, you know, and protect. That first part is serve. And it, so for me, I think about um, just how do the cops in my world, how do they serve the people? Are they doing their job? You know, you know, you have that one cop that um, at the beginning that um, that went, that the one, the first one that was on the scene. Mm-hmm. And then you find, you know, him and Frank have a history, yeah. you know, and and he does, you know. As as you see from even from the beginning, him and Frank have bumped heads because they have two different ideas of what it means to serve and protect, you know. Yeah. And and folks, so, you know, if you want a mystery, a police procedural that's gritty, real, um has a very complex mystery. And it's going to keep you guessing the whole time, but also is based in reality. It's, 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 it's real and gives you new perspectives on the police, uh, black police officers and the interaction between police and the black community. You want to check out blue religion. And, uh, again, this is a really, really fascinating book. You're going to keep turning the pages like, Oh, okay. I'll just read one more chapter and I'll go to sleep. And then, uh, you know, next thing you know, it's three in the morning and you're mad at Mr. Ball. Cause you know, you got to go to work. <laughs> Mr. Ball going to have you up, <laughs> but you can That's write awesome him here. and sorry. let him know. Okay. <laughs> and if you want to get this book or if you want to see uh, all of, uh, Alvin's ball books, hey, just go to, I found this great book.com slash one four seven that's i found this great book.com slash one four seven i have all his books there you can click order it from your favorite uh store you'll be good to go not only that you can get the first book in the series only the holy remain so you know because i got a feeling you're going to read the you know, read Blue Religion, and you're gonna like, now how did he get to this point? And you're gonna go back and read that one too. Uh, and you can follow Alvern on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It's just his name, it makes it real easy A L V E R N E B A L L. So if you want to follow him and harass him because he kept you up all night reading his book, uh, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and I just want you to know, you know, we're, we're talking with, uh, uh an accomplished writer, um, you know, Alvern earned his MFA in fiction writing from, uh, Columbia college, Chicago. And in 2019, uh, the 10 house graphic novel scholar, and is also the recipient of the 2014 and 2015 glip comic rising stars awards. For his writing on One Nation, Old Druids. And in 2009, he received the first ever Luminarts Graphic Novel Writing Award. And as he said, he's a proud native of Chicago. So you have somebody, we got somebody with some uh, credentials behind what they create. And you definitely get that when you look at his writing. But we're going to shift gears a little and we're going to talk about a fascinating project that you've been involved with 
Uh, you partnered with illustrator Stacy Robinson to create a graphic novel that captures the history of Greenwood, Oklahoma, also known as Black Wall Street. So how did this project come about and what was the process like creating it? Yeah, so uh, I guess, again, it's, it's the ancestors' fate, serendipitous or something, serendipity, I guess. Um, I had written a um, TV treatment um, for a, uh, a TV series about Black Wall Street. And one of my friends was like, this could be a really cool graphic novel. And it, it, it had dawned on me then. And um, at the time, my editor, um, John Jennings, um, who would become my editor, uh, he was a friend of mine. I, I reached out to him. It was on the eve of the 99th anniversary of Black Wall Street. And I was like, hey, man, I got this thing. I wrote it as a TV show, but I think it could be a really cool graphic novel about Black Wall Street. And he writes back, he goes, that's funny because I'm talking to artist Stacy Robinson. He just emailed me talking about we should do something on Black Wall Street. And he goes, that's, that's, you know, that's how much coincidence is that? And then a couple of days later, he goes, hey, um, I got this new imprint, Megascope, from Abrams that I'm doing with Abrams Comic Arts. And we want to do something on Black Wall Street. Would you be interested? And I was like, wait, me? And I was like, are you serious, me? Because I and uh, he goes, yeah. You seem to know a lot about it. I was like, yeah. I, I just wrote this thing, and he goes, he goes, yeah. They love this, you know, the, this treatment that you did for this book. But the thing that we need to do um, is going to be much smaller. So can you write something up, um, you know, about that? And we'll keep this other book on the back burner. And I was like, all right. So I wrote up. Um, probably took a couple of days and wrote a uh, a um, outline for uh, a book. Um, and then they um, approved it and then came back after a couple um, notes from editors and marketing and stuff. And then um, I had to write up. A, it was like a Wednesday and I had to do a new draft of a different perspective of the story. And I turned that in like on a Friday and that would become the book Across the Tracks. Mm -hmm. um, remembering Greenwood, Black Wall Street and the Tulsa Race Massacre. And what came out of that was a nonfiction tale of um the creation of black wall street or the tulsa uh or of tulsa i should say um from the beginning all the way up to its um destruction and then its revival um and how that story what i wanted to tell at that moment um was that i wanted to talk about the people that had created black wall street or tulsa um because i felt um when i looked at a lot of the history and what was coming out at the time, um, whether that was, um, what was it? Lovecraft country that had touched on it. And mm -hmm. right before that, the superhero show on HBO, I can't think of it for Watchmen now. Watchmen, Watchmen. Thank you. Had really touched on it and had touched on it in such a way that it grasped the, the American psyche. And everybody was like, wait, this was real. And it was one of those things that just, kind of dumbfounded me that I was like, oh, when so many people are like, wait, this is real, you know, and they kept looking it up and I was like, yeah, it's real, you know, and one of the things I grew up, um, my grandma and them always talked about it, and it, but it was always talked about as like almost, if you think about it as like Wakanda, as like almost being like a fairy tale land, mm -hmm. you know, of things. And um, what drove me to really want to write about it was that every time somebody talked about Black Wall Street, it was always about the race massacre it was always about the massacre. It mm -hmm. was always about the destruction. And I thought, well, I want to tell the story about before the destruction. I want to talk about this place before it was destroyed. Because everybody just wants to talk about, you know, what went on during the day and a half or two days of destruction. And I'm like, but what happened before all that? That's that was what interested me and in how that book came together. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Hmm. And from what I understand, you also talk about the rebuilding of uh, Black Wall Street. Like, what happened after the massacre? What happened after that horrendous event? Yeah. So, after the massacre, the, literally, the city and the state kind of want to sweep this under the rug <laughs> in some ways. And um, while doing the research, one of the things I found to be the most complex of these things was that 
that burned down half the city, or at least Tulsa, you know, the side of the tracks where all the black people live, and destroyed literally billions of dollars of property. And then basically black communities, cities from around the world, um, and not only just black communities, but communities all together, like cities all together, black and white, brown, all came together and reached out to Tulsa, you know, reached out to Oklahoma and was like, hey, we want to help rebuild Tulsa. And, you know, the city, um, the city was just like, no, we, we, we fine. We don't need any help. We'll rebuild it <laughs> on our own. And, and it was like, and it was, you know, and, and during this time, you know, it was really an outpouring, a majority outpouring of black folks, you know, um, from other parts of the, you know, country. And specifically coming out of Chicago, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot, I, I found there was a lot of um, support, you know, of money being that people wanted to send to the city. Mm-hmm. And um, and the white, you know, mayor and all the council people were like, no, Tulsa's okay. It, you know, it'll, it'll be okay. It, it's fine. Greenwood is okay. <laughs> and it was just like, no, it isn't. And so what the residents of Tulsa did um, was that they decided they weren't going to wait for the city and the government, uh, you know, the the, um, the local governments to help them rebuild. So what the residents did was that they started to rebuild their own city themselves. And in the process of doing that, of course, the state um, and the city tried to um, make it a law that every building had to be fireproof. And if they had done that, it would have made it impossible for them to rebuild because how how can any building be actually fireproof? Right, you know? I've yet to see because the even, building that's fire. Right, because right, even now with flame-proof retardant and stuff like that, you know, back then there was none of that, you know? Mm-hmm. So it was like, so they they had that, they like, created all these stipulations and that any new building built had to be fireproof and it had to be do this. It was just all like all these ridiculous stipulations that would have stopped anybody from building anything. And um, there was a group of black lawyers that took this all the way up to the state Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court found that it was unconstitutional. You know, it was they had basically created these laws to keep black folks from building, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and when after they won, literally the day after this was won, the black residents of Tulsa started rebuilding their own city. Mm-hmm. brick by brick hand you know hand by hand all on their own and it probably helped that the only um factory that made bricks was in tulsa mm. so that's where was one of the things that made tulsa mm. so great was that every structure around it um was wooden you know outside of tulsa so all the white neighborhoods all of the white buildings a lot of the buildings that were in downtown you know oklahoma that were built of brick came from the black brick makers because mm. they were the only brick makers in town. So when Tulsa started to rebuild, they were like, I, you know, let me, you know, um, I mean, um, when Greenwood started to rebuild, they were like, okay, we have the means, you know, and they just started rebuilding, <laughs> literally rebuilt the whole town themselves. And that's so great. And it's great. This project exists because there are a lot of people who might not want to read along you know, historical work mm-hmm. uh, because it's a wall of words and it's just intimidating. But uh, yep. a graphic novel is less intimidating, but you get the same story. As a matter of fact, you know, you have the visuals plus the words and the story comes alive. And it's so important that you and Stacey Robinson have created this work. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? I'm fascinated by how writers and illustrators come together to create a work like this? Yeah, so I had to write the script. I think I wrote the script in like a week. I, it was literally a week. I had a week to write the whole script. And um, during that time, I had COVID. So I don't know how I wrote it. Mm. I literally wrote it. In, I wrote it in a fever pitch. <laughs> I'd write like probably one or two hours a day because I would literally be in bed like 22, 23 hours a day, just like, you know, shaking, shivering, going mm-hmm. through it, you know headaches and all. Um, and this was again before there was a, when I had COVID, there wasn't a, a, a vaccine. Mm-hmm. So um, I was literally like, felt like I was on my deathbed at, at moments. Thank God I didn't get to that point where I didn't have a respirator or anything, but it felt like that. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so I wrote the script and then I sent it off to Stacy. And I and usually when I send it off, uh, I try to I try to add notes and visuals about things that I'm looking for. But Stacy was probably one of the, the greatest artists I've real great, worked with because he just went in and he did this meticulous amount of research and trying to find actual images of these people that, you know, because a lot of what Greenwood stood for burned, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was not like there was like albums upon albums or photos upon photos of a lot of these people, you know, just historically saved. Um, So he did a great deal of research and finding what the buildings would be like, the cars, you know, what the clothing would be like, stuff like that. Um, So it was a collaborative effort. And then I remember as I was coming out of, um, COVID called me up and he goes, man, he goes, this script, he goes, man, this is amazing. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> he goes, yeah, you did. He was like, you know, the, the black scene, you put your foot in it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, I was just honored by those words. I was just like, really, man? I, I thought, you know, I did an okay job. You know, I was, I was just, like I said, I, I was under COVID in, in writing. So I was just like, he was like, yeah, man. He's like, this script, I love it. He's like, what did you listen to when you were doing and it? And so we started talking about the music I was listening to. So I would put on old school jazz mm-hmm. um, and blues and I would play that because I was trying to get my mindset into what the music must have been like at that time. And, and I was using music as a way to inform me of what those people were listening to, mm-hmm. you know, and, and imagine this is what either they were dancing to, or this is what was calming them, whether they were going through whatever they were going through in life. And the music helped like transport me to that time, I think, um, more than anything. So I listened to a lot of jazz at that time, a lot of jazz and blues. Um, just imagining this is what it must have been like at that time period. And I tried to stay within that time period. Okay. Um, when listening to that kind of music, it kind of just transported me to it. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's amazing. That's really, really amazing. So, you know, we, we live in a, uh, a world where technology has affected so many things. How has technology affected the creation and distribution of graphic novels? And what do you see as a future for projects like this? Um, I think, uh technology has made it more accessible mm-hmm. um the more people are reading digitally not only graphic novels but books in general but i also see that technology has made it has allowed um has allowed writers especially writers and artists to to kind of break down a lot of doors or become their own um um door you know doorkeepers you know um in that idea of like, it's, I mean, gatekeepers, instead of having to go through a gatekeeper to get something, um, something like a graphic novel done, you can go to Kickstarter and do it yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, you can go to Indiegogo and do it yourself. You can partner up with somebody, self-publish it and and put it out through a, a larger distributor and do it yourself. And now um, I think technology has allowed um, creators of color to really own their own stories, you know to really um, not have to have um, a white gaze, especially if that white gaze is not going to be an ally Mm -hmm. and is going to want you to hinder the story or not tell the truth or, you know, to make it, oh, let's put a spin on it and make it, you know, such in a way that, you know, there's a white savior or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, um, I think technology allows us to now also tell stories especially in the graphic novel form that um that a lot of agents or would be editors especially would be agents and editors who represent graphic novels but don't even read them or have no clear idea of what the graphic form can do it allows creators like me and other creators to go okay you know what that's fine i won't go your route I'm going to go do this story because I know there's an audience for it and uh, Mm -hmm. my audience will find me or I'll find my audience, but, and, you know, I'll make a splash. And sometimes it's not even about making a splash. It's more about making the work and knowing that the work is out there Um, more than like, Oh, I got that contract for the three book deal, but now I only get $10,000 per book. So are you really living off the work where you could have gone to Kickstarter and made 10,000 in one month, you know? Mm -hmm. 
and, and not have to owe anybody um, any royalties. Or just stuff like that that I think about um, um, when it comes to the technology and also to graphic novels. Um, I feel like I'm hoping and praying that it, it's also accessible for more people uh, in different countries to mm-hmm. pick up um, graphic works from, especially um, Black Americans, and start to really not just be influenced by the movies and TV content, but to also be influenced by the graphic novel, by the novels, and and sh- and to show that we're not a monolith of how you know we're not just boys in the hood, or you know we're not just menace to society, you mm-hmm. know. We are greater. Those are parts of a, a greater sum of of the black experience, you know. And I think um, when I did a, before, when I did the first um, initial writing of Across the Tracks, it was trying to show that there was a monolith of, uh, I mean, not a monolith, but there was a variety of African American stories, and that we all weren't just slaves, and you know, mm-hmm. and it was trying to show that there was a working class, there was, you know people that were in the armed forces and that we all had that same double consciousness, that same um, experience to some degree of being black in America. But we also had lives that, that transcended, you know, um, you know, where you had wealthy sharecroppers, you had, you know, poor sharecroppers, you had, you know, indentured servants, you had working class teachers, artists, you know, the whole, there's a whole thing called the Harlem Renaissance. It wasn't just Mm -hmm. that, these people exploded and, and, you know, and they, so it was like all these different lives, you know, living different, just like everybody else in the world. And so I think technology is going to allow us to tell more of our stories and own them. Like, you know, like musicians own the masters of their, their recording. We're going to be able to own our, our stories and, and, and own them, not only in who owns the IP or the rights, but own them in that idea of like, you know, own voices, which is all of a sudden now it's a genre of like, oh, you know, you have publishing houses and agents looking for, you know, content from writers if it's an own voice type of thing. And I'm like, so now we're doing this, but <laughs> we've been doing this for how long? You know, so I, I, I don't know. I get it's a, it's a, again, I guess it's a love hate relationship. But like when I see publishers create like black mystery imprints for black writers, and I'm just like, so you had to create a whole imprint for this black crime writer so that you could publish him or her, but you have a whole imprint that you already published crime under. Why can't that writer of color just publish under the same imprint that you publish all the other crime writing under, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, but because they're black, they need a special imprint just to showcase that they're black, that you're, as a publisher, that you're showing inclusion or as a media company, you're showing inclusion, but really, are you showing inclusion if you're excluding me to a certain imprint or a certain label because of the my racial background? When clearly, I can hold my own with any other writer that you or any other, you know, producer, actor, or whatever you want to call it, in any other medium. But now you've created this this whole new subsection that I can exist in, or I can I exist on the label that you already have. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I can go on about different things <laughs> about that too. <laughs> but it's great now that you're able to do this. And also, uh, you know, the, the wonderful thing about technology is it allows us to connect. So even if, um, you know, you may not have the numbers in your local area, you could connect via the web and we can all share and make each other aware of, uh, cool works like you've produced here. So one question on the creation of the graphic novel, how did this type of writing uh, affect your crime writing longer prose work or did they cross over or? Yeah, I write crime comics too. I actually have a crime comic coming out. Um, It's called um, Crook County. It's coming out from Sacramento Press, the same guys who published Blue Religion. Um, so I have that crime comic coming out. I write another crime comic um, that will be coming out sometime next year called In the Dead of Night. Um, okay. So for me, really, um, my prose actually informs my graphic novel writing 
or vice versa. Um, I've been writing comics and graphic novels probably since I was in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and before that, I was writing um, crime novels, I guess, as a kid <laughs> uh, in grammar school. So it's for me, it, they they both um, they both influence each other in different ways just because, as you said um, earlier, sometimes people don't want to read something historical because it feels like there's a wall of prose, you know, that you have to get through. Whereas if I can do that as a graphic novel, it, I could get it across, you know, much more easily um, because there's less description, at least on my side, that I know the artist will pick up, you know, where I don't have to, I don't have to go in and describe a whole scene and have these characters talking, you know, and, and a lot of it is just you setting up scenes after scenes and descriptions of things, whereas I can do um, a description of, say, something that happens five pages in a novel can happen two pages in a graphic novel, Yeah, you know? <laughs> uh, so I think they both influence the way I, I write um, in different ways. And I think both influence actually my screenwriting more than anything because I'm, uh, uh, I'll write something and I'll send it off to my manager who goes, okay, this is great, but now you're getting a little prose here and he'll start circling. I'll go back and read and I'm like, oh yeah, I guess I am getting more. Uh, like I'll jump, <laughs> I'll start mixing the two where I'm going in between prose and, and I'm like, oh, well. then he goes, yeah, this is a great line here, but it's too flowery or it's too long. And, and he goes, this is something you put in the prose novel. And I'm going, oh, but I like it because it sounds so good. It's <laughs> like, uh, I guess I got to save this for the prose novel. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so they, I think they all influence the writing in one way or aspect um, in a way that I never think of. Um, when I'm writing prose, I'm really into that world. I'm trying to pick up all the senses and smells that are in um, that are in a scene or wherever those characters are. Whereas in a graphic novel, I don't have to m- too much describe like sense of smell or sense of place, you know, or the touch of something because you can't feel that. You know, when you're reading a graphic novel, you see it more than you feel it. You right. Know? right. Yeah, that, that's that's wonderful. And again, um, this is definitely something everybody should check out. Definitely want to check out Across the Tracks, Remembering the Tulsa Race Massacre and Black Wall Street. Just recently published, right? Yeah, it came out in May. Yep. Right at uh right before the hundred year anniversary mm-hmm. of the massacre. Yeah, definitely. Definitely gonna check that out. And and we're gonna be looking forward to those uh new graphic uh crime novels you got coming. Uh oh yeah, yeah. they're coming. Yeah, <laughs> they're yeah. definitely coming. <laughs> definitely definitely gonna be looking for those. So awesome. you yeah, know Crook you, County is what it's called. Crook County C R O K C R O O K. County, yeah. So okay. yeah, in Chicago we call so in Chicago there's a county called Cook County, but mm-hmm. we call it Cook County. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. And um, also you know you you're a very accomplished writer. I came across an article you wrote for Writers Digest. Interesting title. Oh, five, it came out. Five things I learned about writing from watching soap opera. Wait, they came out. I didn't even know it was out yet. Wow! Yeah, yeah it's, it's out there. It's out there. <laughs> oh, wow! I gotta go find it now. I did not know it was out there. <laughs> so, everyone, you need to yeah, go there. So, I'm gonna put the link yeah, in the yeah. show notes, and uh, or you can go to uh, I found this great book dot com slash one four seven. I'll have a link to it there. But yeah, you, yeah, you, you you're everywhere, man. That's good. That's a good. Thing. Oh, yeah. I'm trying, man. I'm trying. Yeah. So I learned how to write comics, really, um, and how to tell a great story from soap operas, really. Mm -hmm. That's where I think my first um, inclination of when I started to realize that there was story was watching soap operas. Yeah. I love some soap operas. (laughs) Yeah, because they managed to make you come back day after day. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It's a fast. And you have these characters that people follow for years, and most people, you know, it's fascinating. I know people tend to look down on certain genres and oh, certain man. art forms, but you got to look at the fact that people love it and people come back to it. And, uh, you know, reading is about enjoyment. It's not about 
just making it difficult for the sake of being difficult so you can sit in a room and thank your superior. Uh, you read yep. to enjoy. Those are life minutes you're spending. And yes, yeah, life minutes are too valuable to just. <laughs> if I want to work hard, I could just put a boulder on my back and walk up a hill. That's hard, you know? Yes. <laughs> right, right. If I just want torture. But no, I I think it's great. I think it's really, really great what, what you're doing. And again, everyone, just go to ifoundthisgreatbook.com slash 147. I'll have all of the books that Alvern has there and also links to everything we talked about, like that great article. Also, is a real cool video you did with Magic City Books, you and uh, Stacy. Where you talk about oh, yeah. the creation of the uh, of the graphic novel, so there's a lot, and we got something to look forward to, folks. Crook County graphic novel crime yeah. story, and we're also going to keep following you, Alvern. We're going to keep uh, bugging you on uh, all the social means. <laughs> No, like, <laughs> Facebook, yeah. Twitter, and Instagram. I hope so. <laughs> and, I hope so. Uh, remember, everybody, you can follow him. It's real easy. It's just his name, A L V E R N E B A L L, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So you can fuss at him for keeping you up half the night reading uh, Blue Religion. And then you can keep asking him, hey, when's that graphic novel coming out, man? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Alvern will be upset if people keep asking, when's the next book? I don't think, I've never heard a writer say, man, I wish people could ask me when my next book's coming out. (laughs) I just got to write it. (laughs) Yeah, you got to write it. It's not easy, but at least you know somebody wants to read it. So, and and I think you're, you're, you're going to, you're on a great role here. And again, uh, fast paced novel definitely makes you turn the pages and, Really great opportunity here with the depiction of what happened in Tulsa and making it an approachable story for a lot of people. So, uh, especially for folks, if you want your young person in your life to get into history, but you know, you're handing them a book with 800 pages isn't going to work. You know that. This is the thing to get. And uh, you can get an electronic format. So, if you're on your tablet, you can view it. Right, you can you can get electronic, yep. right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yes, and they, and they and the graphic novels look great on that. If it's on your Kindle or your tablet, it really looks great and uh, makes it so approachable. So definitely, folks, you definitely want to check out Alvern Ball. Alvern, thank you, thank you, thank you for thank you sharing this time with me, and um, really looking forward to your next work. Oh, thank you so much. Well, everybody, stay safe and have a great reading day.